We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. BJ, welcome back. Thank you. I don't think you had a beard quite so exquisite as you do now the last time we spoke. Oh, that's my lockdown beard. <laughs> but it looks so it's good, man. Time. It looks like you've got the perfect curls and everything. It's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. I've just, like, been really lucky with my hair scene. <laughs> so True. it just naturally grows out. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was no plan, actually. I just thought, okay, it's lockdown. I'm just going to see if it grows out. And uh, I guess it went with the whole guru identity and i was like yeah it kind of works why not <laughs> dude it, it reminds me of sad guru do you follow sad guru on insta <laughs> yeah i do yeah he's, he's legendary cool. yeah he's really good i really love him no but it suits you man like even from like a non-guru perspective it just it just i think it just suits you it's good because it goes with the hair oh, thank as well you. it's good i'm not quite so lucky i'm losing my hair so i think i'm giving all my hair to you <laughs> A lot of people are against them. <laughs> true, true. Hey, listen, how have you found the lockdown anyways? Oh, it's been amazing. It's just like, it's been the best time of my life, actually. Mm. Why is that? Yeah. Well, obviously there was this a sense of like guilt-free music production time because I don't have to go anywhere and I don't have to be in anything else. And I'm just like, yep, I can just make music and you know, no guilt, but also it forced me to move away from the float kind of model where I didn't have to, I couldn't go to a float center Mm. and I couldn't use the float tank for my clients. So it forced me to move my whole business online. Mm. And um, now that's amazing because now I have an option of going physically to some place and meeting my clients physically, or I'm just able to do it online, which just made my whole setup mobile. So you, so your business, because yeah, this is one of the, one of the things I want to get into. Um, so your business for everyone who is interested, we spoke about this last time. It's essentially life coaching through utilization of the float tank as well. So you do like a forty-five minute um, conversation, a float tank, and then a forty-five minute kind of cool down. Is that has it changed much since then? It has now. So obviously, I'm also learning and I'm growing. Yes. So now I've moved more towards. Um, the Vedic side of things and using the tank as a tool still, but I'm not spending my time with the 45 and 45 after, whereas I've come up with a system where I just do it in one session straight in three hours and the client does the float later on when they have time. So it freed up both of our timings. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you will do, so you do the three hours and then they'll have the float tank, do they use that to kind of like integrate the conversation that you've had with them or, or like what's, what yes. this comes up? Yeah. So now I've like integrated Ayurveda into the float tanks and I'm really getting into like understanding how do I use the tank? Cause we're trying to find balance. Mm-hmm. So I'm really um, recommending the tank at a certain time of the day and really, um, understanding different types of people who could use the tank differently. For example, if your mind is really busy, then I would say you're a Pitta type and the Pitta type person would float at this time of the day to balance the Pitta nature out. And they would do a certain kind of activity in the tank to balance that out. So I'm really focused, zooming into it now. Dude, that's epic. Yeah. Cause I don't think I've spoken to anyone else who has tried to look at how, consciousness changes dependent upon different variables within and without the float tank. I actually think you're the first person Mm. that's doing this. (laughs) Uh, It seems like it because I was lucky to do a talk uh, for the float conference this year. I got nominated and I just presented my talk. I had no idea about what people are into. I just did my thing and people are like, Oh dude, this is like pretty new. And um, yeah, float senders started to work with me. So that happened. But also what I've started doing is I've started replicating more people like me. So I've started coaching people who are interested in the float tank 
to find their own niche and use the tank as a tool. So I've got like about five people I'm training now. So that's oh another thing God. I've started. It's like a beta B coaching. Yes. So I've like, I'm one side, I'm directly working with clients for their well being, and the other side, I'm creating more coaches. Oh, dude, that's amazing. Yeah. So let, let's, let's, um, just for context, people who are listening or watching this might not have listened to the first show. So your, your history, I think is so cool. We started using the float tank and correct me if I'm wrong. You were, you know, um, playing around with your sleep. You were playing around with taking a coffee before it, some psychedelics mm-hmm. perhaps, um, you know, and just trying to observe how your mind was changing in each of those states. What was, what were some of the most profound experiences you had on different substances or, you know, different variables? Well, just like being able to reset myself after a float was one of the biggest things. The way my body felt initially, it was just like, wow, my body feels so good. Like it just feels like I've got the best massage of my life and more. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And that enabled me to sit for longer working on my music, but also I realized my focus was changing. I was able to focus on things as if I've just, as if I'm high, just that little bit of extra focus and getting rid of all the clutter. So that started to happen. Um, So these were the first few layers. And then I started to notice how I just had more space in my being. So the best way to explain that is um, obviously after the first lockdown, I was during that lockdown, I was also watching a lot of TV shows and I was watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine and <laughs> all this was happening. And totally. when I went for the first float after three months, I could see all these characters pop up in my vision in the tank. Mm-hmm. And I realized, I was like, ah, because I wasn't floating regularly, I wasn't clearing out my subconscious, whatever that was, I was absorbing into me. Yeah. And this I figured out later, I was like, ah, that's what I was doing early on when I started floating. I was clearing out all the clutter and then I was able to feed myself with the information and the kind of the vibe that I needed to hold to be where I want to go. So it was enabling me to kind of reset in that zone. So I started noticing all these things. And one of the experiences I remember was say on edibles and um, I thought I was dying. And I thought, ooh, if this is dying, this is amazing. So that was one of the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. That's awesome. That's so Yeah, cool, so these, yeah. these little experiences that I took, for, another one in the same float was when, so obviously I was floating after hours and I thought I heard something and instantly my body just, it felt like it secreted this chemical of fear. And this toxin throughout my body and instantly everything about me changed. Just that one thought that, Ooh, there must be someone here changed everything in the float. Suddenly my temperature was different. My heartbeat was racing and the thoughts I started getting started to like spiral out. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then I thought, okay, people must be going through this every day kind of stuff. Whoa. So what was the thought? Just like, oh, there's someone here. Because I was floating after hours and I thought I heard like the door. Oh, yes, was, yes, yes. So how could it be? And I was like, oh, there's someone here. And then just that one thought changed my whole biochemistry instantly. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a perfect example of how, you know, people still think that the idea of thoughts, um, you know, influencing our reality, you know, they still perceive that as woo-woo, you know. Um, and woo-woo is amazing because it's the precipice of, uh, of what we know and pushing those boundaries is uh, you need people on those kind of extreme areas to, to, mm-hmm. to pull us forwards. And some, sometimes they pull us backwards, but you know, if they don't pull us backwards, then we don't know. Dude, I, I had a um, similar experience that one of the first times, I think it was the first time I ever floated. Uh, you mentioned before clearing out the clutter and I, I never really understood that. Like I, I, I'd read the Bhagavad Gita and I'd, you know, uh, purging the, the, the mind, you know, cleansing the mind, purging the heart. You know, that was a, a, a quote that um, Radhakrishna wrote in the, in the introduction that really stood out to me. I was like, what does that mean? You know, um, the first float that I ever did, it was, it was about 20 minutes into it. And I had this experience where I just remembered uh, a friend of mine and she, it was actually a really close friend of mine, his ex-girlfriend. And she was going through a rough trot and all this sort of stuff. And it was about six months ago. And I just had this extreme sense of guilt rush over me. And it came back to me that she had reached out to me on Facebook, 
you know, asking for some help because she was struggling. But because I was kind of sided with my friend, I just disregarded her. And because my mind was so busy in that time of social media and all that sort of stuff, six months later, that float tank was that first time that I'd, my mind had kind of come back to that experience and, and forced me to feel the guilt that I'd clearly, uh, you know, suppressed. And I felt this guilt for like 10 minutes. And then I came out of it and I was like, man, I've, I've really got to respond to that message. And then we ended up having a, a coffee together. It was really good, but it's just crazy how like you might say something, I oh, just float tanks are so good for decluttering the mind. But on a really practical standpoint, like that shit can stay in there for so long if we're not careful. 100%. 100%. And it's like, it can only go away once you find stillness. It doesn't matter if it's a tank or your day-to-day stuff. Till you find stillness, it stays there. It doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. And it keeps like accumulating over time. And that's how people start forming these ideas about, you know, how it should be and their whole, everything about them is that aspect of not able to clear it out. It's kind of mm-hmm. crazy. It's it's unbelievable. It, it's just unbelievable how much those things affect you. You know how much the how much mm. the things that you don't even know or remember are actually affecting you in the in the real time. And mm. you said something on our first show. I was asking you, I think, about excavating the unconscious, going back into the past, and trying to resolve some of the trauma. And you were really adamant about this idea that all you need is just your awareness. Could you talk mm. a little bit more about that? <laughs> that's that's. So I see a lot of people nowadays with say any sort of therapy or any sort of healing modality, they want to go and work on their childhood, on their past events so that they can have a good present and then live a good future. Mm -hmm. That idea, just because everyone's doing it, I don't think it's right in the sense that it doesn't fit my logic. It doesn't fit the way I see the world. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, we all know at some to some level that um, past influences your present and your future. This is a firm belief that we all live with, but there is no way you can like really put your finger on it because what I do today is going to influence the past automatically. You know, like obviously our hero Alan Watts talks about it where he's like the bark of a tree, the bark of a dog by changing the future word i've changed the whole meaning of the sentence right yeah. so the moment you give your past the power to influence your present it's going to do it mm. and the moment you look back and you say okay i need to fix something or heal some part of me there are three things that happen the first thing is realize that the universe is a vibration it's an up and a down that come together So, and when an event takes place, it comes with the both positive and the negative. So perceive positive and negative together. So if you go and fix something in your past, you remove the positive along with it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. What your, your unique, whatever the unique nature of you is, it's gone with that. Secondly, do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's like the whole idea that. If I was, for example, when I was in the States, I got beaten up and put in lockers and all that. But now I have a different respect for people who go through that. If I remove that experience, I won't have this compassion towards other people. So obviously I'm going to be someone else. Yes. You can't separate the two. Yeah. And we get so obsessed with that. Hey, like we, we are so obsessed as a species with trying to have yang without yin. Yes. Right. So that's the flaw in everyone's logic, because now the reason you feel you need to change it because you're not happy with who you are today and you're trying to be someone else. Now, Mm. this trying to be someone else is the reason why you want to go do all these things. Secondly, we all know that the universe is a fractal. What do I mean by that? The moment you look at something and you zoom into it, it's an infinite resolution. It always shows up more of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if I have a mentality that I need to go and heal and fix whatever has happened, then that's all I'm going to keep looking at. And the moment I go and look at something, it's infinite. I'm always going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people who have been healing for the last 20 years. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. We can get uh, addicted to our healing journeys. And, you know, at what point do you just go, the, the, the final point of this healing journey is recognizing that I'm always going to be flawed. And that's what makes me human. 
Exactly. And the flaw is always coming with the opposite side that's waiting for you to just, the awareness has to go on to the positive of the same experience. So for that, you start today. So no matter what you do, the whole journey is about saying, okay, I'm accepting who I am today and looking at the positive. Mm -hmm. So there is no need for that. And thirdly, we also know that the universe is only now. Everything else is an illusion. So why are we trying to go and fix the illusion over and over again? So once you know this, when you see someone trying to do it, all I can do is like, hey guys, no. But then you can't because the whole world is going that way. And then, you know, it's like an uphill struggle. You're like, guys, you don't see it clearly. <laughs> but then, hey, you know, that's, the, that's what it's going to take for people to really see. Yes. That you can't separate these events. It's, for example, someone's like, one of my um, clients, he was like, oh, but this is what happened to me, you know? I was a, say for example, I'm not comfortable in my skin. I'm always anxious if I go around with people, da, 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 da. And I want to get rid of this. Why? Why do you want to get rid of that? The reason you want to get rid of it is what is causing you the anxiety. And you, because of people, you perceive other people as they're perfect. They're perfect. I want to be perfect. <laughs> mm. You know, mm. I get anxious. I get anxious when I go into certain situations, but I'm comfortable in certain situations. And I know that. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Right? Uh, man, yeah, I love talking so to you. That's what I was you're, talking about last time. <laughs> yeah. You. I always feel so much more present when I'm always hanging out with you, dude. That's <laughs> so good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so also, I just feel like, oh, I'm really, like when you said all you have is now, I'm like, ooh, the microphone is, is much more lovely now. <laughs> You know, nice. your beard is much more black, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just good. It's good. No, you're, you're exactly right. We, we, uh, you know, one of the things I was trying to write about in my second book was this idea that this pursuit of happiness is always going to lead to sadness. You just can't, mm -hmm. the more you try to go, you know, and people have been writing about this. I, I remember reading, um, uh, a, a Christian, I can't remember where it was. His name was. Bernard Clevo, I think he said, and dost thou strive fervently towards the north, you know, and the more we strive to the Sorry, north. Sorry, say that again, north, please. He said something like, dost thou strive fervently towards the north? And then he went on to say, okay. the more we strive to the north, the further we'll lead to the south, you know, and it's yes. exactly your point. So this idea of kind of transcending the opposites is this idea of just learning to love both to some degree. Yes. Yes. And that's it. To realize, to observe that you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. And every time an event takes place, either I'm excited because I perceive it as a great event or I'm excited because I'm like, oh, I wonder where this is going to go because right now I feel average, but this is going to go somewhere else. So I'm again, excited about it. Yes. Yes. So what was some of your, because I, do, do you think there's any merit though in like, if we have some kind of, so trauma is the big thing right now to your point, you know, yes childhood trauma and kind of bringing up this stuff from the past. Do you think there is any benefit in, you know, perhaps not getting too attached to it, but just in observing the past and recognizing, Oh wow, that actually kind of did affect me there. And, you know, do you think there's anything to that? Um, look, again, we have to define what trauma are you talking about? Right. For example, if it's real nowadays, people uh, consider they've been traumatized if their mom yelled at them when they were 14 years old saying, hey, you know, get away from here. And that creates trauma. I mean, that is the nature of the universe. Like you go to, say, for example, India, mm -hmm. I mean, kids still get their ass whooped by their parents so intensely uh, for missing out their homework for one night. <laughs> That's how life is. And the same yeah. thing with ADHD, you know. Kids are not meant to focus. That's their job. They're not meant to focus. Like when I was a kid, I couldn't focus for two seconds on anything. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, it's what are you trying to do? That is the key to answer this question. Mm -hmm. So what happens is there might be, again, but if it is, I try to live my life in a very like absolute level. From that level, there is no need for you to do anything because if you do, then you're playing the illusion. But once you know you're playing the illusion, go for it because mm. that's a really nice game to play. But don't <laughs> think that it's real. So at any level, uh, I would say, no, there's no point. But you can say, but Vijay, look, you know, I'm playing the game. I know that at that level, see, there's like two levels all the, every time because if I ask you in outer space, which way is north, south, east, west? 
There's no answer. No reference point. But yeah, but in Earth level, you've got north, south, east, west. So the same way in the absolute level, not everything is absolute rubbish because the past is actually a complete illusion. Yeah. And uh, you, what you do today can completely change that event and say that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Right. Mm. But if you want to play the game, then absolutely go for it. And uh, it's going to take you for a good ride. Enjoy it. And then come out safely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It is. It, it is like a game, isn't it? It's like, okay, I'm going to decide to play this soccer game. I'm going to play some footy in the same way that, you know what, I'm going to jump on a troop here. I'm going to jump in the float tank. I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to accept the ups and downs like a roller coaster. But uh, yeah, I like that. I love that playing the game idea because it helps us to not get too attached to, to what we're doing. Exactly. And I mean, that's all it's about. Like just choosing the ones that you want to play. Mm. Right. And to really know that whichever one you believe will become true. Mm. What do you mean by that? It doesn't. So if you really choose to believe, I was thinking about this actually. Um, if you observe something in your life, right? For example, if I'm observing, I've been to a lot of ancient temples and I'm really understanding the way they've built it and all that. So I'm taking my belief into a line of thought where my mind is automatically focusing on these kinds of things and I'm creating a reality based on that. So that is true for me. And the same is true for you. Whatever you're focusing on and you're trying to believe into, that is the reality for you. Yes. And everyone is creating their own pocket of these realities. So once you realize that whatever you believe is going to be true, doesn't matter what it is for you, then now you have the freedom to say, okay, that's true for them. This is true for me. So if I believe that there's nothing to do with trauma, then that's true for me. Mm. But if someone else believes that nah, this is what it is because it makes sense for my logic, then that becomes true in their reality. Yeah. Is that why we have such a, a big issue with politics in this day and age? A hundred percent. And that's the reason why we have an issue with every single thing. Yeah. Because the moment you say yes to one idea, you're automatically saying no to the other. Mm, mm. Without being able to see both are potentially right, depending on the perspective. Both are right. Because yes. the, either both are right or they're both wrong in the sense they're both made up one by individual, whoever's doing it. Or they're both right in the sense you have the right to make up whatever you want. I have the right to make up whatever I want. Yeah. That's the reason why you have like 33 million gods in Hinduism. Because you can make anything into a god and say, this is my god. And no one can say no. Because the, the way I made my god is the exact way you're making your god. So I can't say no to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That's awesome, man. That's so cool. Yeah, I never understood that. I, I was Because I, I had, a, I had a, um, a Catholic upbringing. You know, we're always taught that, you know, Jesus was the savior. And then I got a little bit more interested in Buddhism and I was like, oh, okay, so this religion isn't really a religion. It's just kind of like a practice. So it's just like, mm -hmm. look, these are the four noble truths. Life's tough. The reason it's tough is because you get attached to things. This is how to not get attached to things, you know, and here's what to do about it. Follow this eightfold path. I'm like, oh, this is pretty interesting. But where's the God? Yes. It's like, well, he wasn't really a God. He was just like a nice guy that came from everything and then sat under a tree. And I was like, yeah, but where's the God? And then I looked into Hinduism and they're like, Hey, Buddhism, we got you covered. We'll give you all the gods in the yes. world. You'd be like a billion, billion gods. But what, exactly. what, what's going on in Hinduism? Is it like gods as representations of individual aspects? Or yeah, what are the gods all meaning? So, so Hinduism is basically, it's a new word that people have coined. It's called right. Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma means the eternal truth. That's why it's been sustaining itself for so long. So mm -hmm. it's a way of life. And what they talk about is that, see, it's nothing to do with any like historical event. It's to do with the liberation side. So the central point of Hinduism is moksha, mm -hmm. liberating yourself from the life and death cycle. And the way they approach life is amazing. Um, for example, if you have, say, 10 grams of protein, right? You don't, you've never seen protein in your life. Mm -hmm. You, you don't even know what it is. You've never seen an electron. You've never seen a proton. You've never seen all these things. It's all abstract ideas, right? So what the Hindus have done is like, okay, I am going to use my body as a filter, my senses as a filter, and I'm going to formulate a reality. And that's where they start, right? Mm -hmm. And what they've done is taken 
and started deducing using experience and using pure logic and using whatever they can to deduce a certain way of living. So what they've come up with is saying, look, what it is, we'll never know. It's impossible to know what it is because there's always this being that's filtering things out, mm. right? So what we'll do is we'll give what it is that we'll never know some characteristics so that it will get you really close to what it is that you'll never know. Mm. <laughs> Once you get there, from there, it's just like a matter of time before you fill out the other part. So that's when you get the gods. So the gods are, are the personal absolute reality. That makes sense. Okay. So this, so so this is that per- Satvam Asi idea. Is it, Satvam Asi, I, yeah. When we spoke last time, man, I just I want to give you some context. You blew my mind in so many ways. I was already really into this. I was writing a lot about it. But the way you spoke about it, you know, I kept asking you about like, what is your God? What is your God? And you were just like, it's that. It's just that. I'm like, well, what is that? And you're like, it's that. I'm like, oh, man, this guy's pissing me off, but I love him. <laughs> so I just kept looking right into it. And I think if I'm right, it's got something to do with as soon as you say it, it immediately becomes not the thing. So that's why yes. it was almost kind of like this, you know, lackluster disregard of whatever that is, which is also paradoxically the fundamental truth. Yes, exactly. So the moment I speak about it, it's not that because obviously now there's so many filters of like language and meaning and all that. Because the way it is, okay. See, I know for a fact that I have a waking life, dreaming life and deep sleep. Right? Mm. So in my waking life, I can see things in front of me. I can feel it and all that. So if I'm seeing my phone in front of me, I know for a fact that I am not that phone Mm. because I am perceiving it. Mm -hmm. So if I perceive anything, I'm not that Mm. because there's a perceiver behind all of this. So only during my deep sleep, am I that now, because I'm in deep sleep, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Anything I say about it. So reality can only be expressed in, this thing called neti neti, which means not, not, it's not that it's not that. Yeah. So that's why we say it's that because what it is, I don't know, but I am that. Uh, Okay. And that's why, you know, some of those kind of spiritual teachings are always trying to tell us to observe our thoughts because when we observe them, we no longer are that which is causing all of the suffering. Yes. It's like when people say, I am sad. I'm like, no, you're not sad. Yes. You are feeling sadness. Yes. Completely different. I am not a DJ. I DJ. True. Yes. (laughs) Completely different. That's awesome. Right. So what we do is we just observe our waking life, dreaming life, and then we deduce these facts. And where I'm at right now is called Advaita Vedanta, non-dual reality. And that's where I've kind of hit like a wall in terms of understanding the nature of reality. Um, Say, for example, if everything is a vibration, then I know that if everything is changing, everything I know is changing, in order for that to exist, there must be something that never changes. Jesus. And... So, so what doesn't change then is the, just the infinite, even though yes, now that I've said that, there has to be something that is the not infinite. But now we have to say, okay, dude, we realize that because we have a limitation, you don't have to tell me that when you say infinite, it's not that I understand what you're saying right. because now we've created a convention, <laughs> right. right? Now we say, okay, it's really hard to think about this infinite dude. Like I really can't think about it. I'll be like, okay, why don't we draw this guy with like a blue kind of body and give him four arms and say, this represents infinity. You're like, yep, I can do that. Yes. 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 (laughs) And now we say, okay, what about we call this guy God? And you're like, okay, cool. But I'm, we know that this is not the ultimate reality. It's again, pointing towards the ultimate reality. Mm, mm. So it's those who know the Tao do not speak about the Tao. Yes, because when you speak about it, it's not that anymore. Yeah, it just becomes this like um, natural contentment about things. Yes. So now because everything is changing, I know there is something that is never changing, 
Right. Now, if everything is a vibration, that is, if everything is manifesting, there must be something that has the potential to manifest everything. Mm. Right. Mm. So that which is the unmanifested potential, that is known as Brahman. That is the absolute reality. And because you come from that, you are that. Mm. Because you come from the unmanifested reality and you come. Now there's one thing. I've, so how do I know that I am that and I'm not a part of that? Mm -hmm. So now again, see in Vedic thought, there is no abstraction. It's only observation. Now what they've observed is that take any sort of life. It represents the part represents the whole. So if I take a seed and the seed has the tree contained in it, mm -hmm. right? If I take one strand of DNA from you, you will remain you. Mm -hmm. But I know every single thing about the planet, the solar system, the star that is circling to create a human. And I know everything about you till this point in time. Mm -hmm. So I take one DNA from you and I can re rec recreate the whole of you. Now, that is true in every scale, which means... I am the DNA of that. So I am that. Yes. So there's nothing I need to know about that. I just have to look at me and this is that. <laughs> you know, this is something that I really wish uh, both, both scientists and spiritual folk could see. This, it's, to me, the, the Eastern philosophies and Eastern traditions are some of the most logical philosophies out there, despite the fact yes. they're all kind of thrown in the bundle as religion and all this sort of stuff. What you said to me there, and I think for all the listeners listening as well, is very, very logical. You know, yes. it, it, you, you've just kind of traced the current manifestation to its basic principle. As far as I'm aware, you've just taken it back to, to the initial seat, and that makes a whole lot of sense to me. And despite that truth, science and religion has this, this just unwavering war against each other. And the scientists say, no, we're, we're, we're stardust and we all came from the Big Bang. And, and religions say, oh, you know, well, it's all God, it's all Brahman. Really, that's just the same thing, different words. You know, Big Bang, Brahman, stardust, thou art that. It's all the same thing. Yes, in a way, but the, the starting point is different. Okay. So the starting point for the modern way of thinking is all to do with external. Yes. For example, everything is an abstract in the modern world. Everything is an abstract, right? Don't believe anything till you have experienced it. This should mm -hmm. be the first criteria of your life. If you haven't mm -hmm. thought about it, if you haven't experienced it, don't believe it. So if someone tells me that there's some vitamin C in this chai, I wouldn't believe them at all. I'd be like, who are you? How do you even know? Mm -hmm. You've never done the experiment. Why should I believe you? Yes. But if you tell me that this chai is going to make you feel a bit active, then I'm like, okay, let me try. And then I can gauge myself if it's going to make me active or not. Now, that is a truth. Mm. So, so you're saying we should have like a pragmatic approach to life? Uh, what do you mean by pragmatic? So it's in like do it and then follow the doing. So it's like if I... so like Only... Yes, exactly. Only take as your belief the ones that you have done it yourself. Mm. Right. For example, if I'm going to have like, you know, say 20 grams of protein after training, that doesn't mean anything to me. Like it doesn't, what does that even mean? Yeah, well-being <laughs> nowadays has become like, yeah, well-being has become like a lab kind of scene where they, everything is done in the lab, but you're not in a lab. You're living your life day to day. Have an apple. If it makes you feel good, boom. Oh, I had it today. It made me feel good, but yesterday it made me feel bad. Okay. Did you have it at the same time of the day? Oh no, I had it at night. I had it at the day. Boom. At night, it's not good. At day, it's good. Write it down. That's mm, it. <laughs> that's awesome, man. <laughs> so good. I love it. Maybe we should just all start eating apples. <laughs> I think it's the best idea. <laughs> best idea that's come across right? on the podcast. So, say that again? It's the best idea that's, that's come on the podcast, I think. Just start eating <laughs> apples. <laughs> yeah, and start experimenting because, see, it's people live their lives. So like I was saying, the, the starting point is different. The starting point in modern way of thinking is objective. Mm -hmm. But your whole reality is subjective. I mean... Mm -hmm. People, all they have to do is just sit there and think about one point. You don't know anything that 
hasn't gone through your filter. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. So if you have an objective reality, you're always looking for something outside of you. Mm. And you tend to forget that, oh, this is outside of me. Uh, let me see what this is made of. Mm. And that's different to what am I making out of this? Yes. Yes, that's and so that's true. The yeah, that's the main difference. So that's what I've done recently in the Vedic way of life. Veda is to see, obviously, to see and only take into consideration things that I know for a fact. Mm. And it's so buzzy because I know there's day and I know there's night. Right. I know there's this ball of fire that goes up because I feel the heat. And I know there's other rock that comes up at night. And I know that if I water plants, then it grows. And I know that you need salt. So I've just make, made a list of things that I can know only mm. by my observation. So what would you say to someone then who loves that, but at the same time is kind of uh, concerned that if they only live their life based upon what they know that might kind of lead them to this sense of, well, all I know is all that needs to be known. And therefore, you know, they're happy to kind of forego continuing to seek further truths. Okay. So once you start living your life this way, then you will start having different kinds of question to seek the truth. It will still be subjective. It won't be an objective truth of what is reality made of. That truth will go away because that line of thought is going to change. Mm -hmm. Infinity is still going to be there. It's the same way how science is trying to break down an atom and a molecule and to see what it is. It's infinity. Your own mind is also the same way. It's infinity. But the difference is you're going inwards, engaging your own mind. So there'll never be a stop point. You'll still be interested and it's all the same, but the angle in which you're not external, but internal. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, so yeah. So it's just by seeking your own truth, you will inevitably come to seek further truths because yes, the, 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 the questions of today you'll fundamentally answer and those will eventually lead to questions of tomorrow. Yes, automatically. That's, you know, dude, I, I was uh, having the last podcast, actually, I was having a conversation with an astrophysicist. So great, Lewis. Cool. I love him. Uh, it's the first time, it's the third time I spoke to him, actually. And I was asking him about, you know, spirituality and psychology and meaning. And um, he started saying these things like, you know, science might have come to its inevitable conclusion. And I was like, what do you mean by that, dude? And he's like, well, you know, we, we've, we've got to the point now where we're studying and observing the same things and reaching the same conclusions. And he was like, maybe science has reached all it can reach. You know, they've split to your point. They split the molecule. They found atoms. They split the atoms. They found protons, neutrons, and electrons. They went even further. They found quarks. You know, it's like, okay, how much further do we need to go before we realize that's all that, we can kind of observe. And I think what's actually happening to really kind of pull this out, I think that the evolution of the way we see the world, it came from acting and then watching ourselves act, which was myth. And then myth turned to religion, religion to philosophy, philosophy to science. And I think what's coming up now is this kind of new age movement begins to stir is that we're starting to kind of pull East and West together to, to transcend science into what will be the next kind of, you know, big thing. Absolutely. And the combination, you and I have like thought about this, where does it meet? Mm. So it'll meet at a jun junction where, for example, take medicine, right? Um, so if I have to treat my body as a mechanic, because see, the line of thought that comes is that there's a creator who made the world. Mm -hmm. That's where science started off. There's a mm -hmm. creator, then they got rid of God, obviously, and then there's someone who made the world. Now, if you treat the world and you as mechanical parts, then science and technology is amazing to fix that issue. Mm -hmm. For example, if I have a broken bone, which is like a part of me, then science and technology and medicine is amazing to just fix me. Yes. But that, that is where you use it. For example, if I have to get some work done in terms of technology, then it's good. But if it's anything to do with me, 
and my awareness, then there's a gap because then it becomes into the subjective realm and then that's when you use these guys as knowledge and be like ah these guys are all about consciousness and subjective so then you bring that on board so you can really balance it out for example i love making music and it's all about technology and science so i'm fully embracing that part yeah. but if it has something to do with my mind then i would fully go into the other side so that balance is great when you like mix it together It's so true. It, sometimes you do need to treat the symptom. You know, um, I was having this conversation with my um, other half, Siobhan, and, um, you know, she she's so, so into holistic health and treating the mind, you know, and, and getting to the root cause. And then that's obviously going to have this incredible ripple effect, you know, and she was really struggling with allergies and, um, you know, she, she's getting all this hay fever and all this kind of stuff. And she was saying to me as she was, you know, going through all the pain, she's like, oh, I know it's just because I've been eating shit for the past couple of days. Now we know we, we both got a background. I know you do too as well in, in, in health, you know, physical movement, nutritional health. We know that bad food is going to spike insulin. It's going to increase inflammation. It's going to cause all these issues. You're going to get autoimmune deficiencies, all this kind of stuff. So hay fever, the root cause of hay fever can often be, Uh, emanating from this kind of source of inflammation. So she knows all the root cause, but she's struggling with the pain and going through the hay fever. Like given that you know the root cause and that the fix to the root cause is just going to be eating healthily over the next you know couple of days, week, just take a Claritine. It's going to help you with the symptom. You know, I think when we start treating the symptom entirely as though it is the root cause and just copying a shit ton of Claritine, you know, and still eating pizza and drinking Coke all the time. It's like, well, you've got the wrong idea there. But to your point, having the balance of the both, it's like if we, if we want to treat everything from the mind, that's really good. But recognizing sometimes that the West and science is really like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for adrenaline and helping me get over my anaphylaxis. So I want to be good with my inflammation. But at the same time, I need EpiPens. <laughs> Exactly. It's like finding that balance. Again, if when you're treating your body as this mechanical thing, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, if I say get into an accident, then I'm not going to go sitting in Ayurveda and start <laughs> meditating. I'll be like, take me to the doctor now and fix this <laughs> shit. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah, it's like definitely there's some sort of a balance that everyone needs to strike. See, mm -hmm. what I find is the moment you don't have, the moment you go too much, too much towards one side, yeah. you become who you don't want to be. Yeah. That's so true. It's so true, Instantly, man. Instantly you like become like the other side. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, I think this is why I love Alan Watts so much. I think what his lessons and reading his books have done for me is to, you know, try and make sure that, I continually see the world as yin and yang all the time. Mm. And, and mm. anywhere I'm too much yin, I need to pull it back on the yang and, and vice versa. Mm. You know, th this is, this is everything. I, I think this is the, this is the fundamental lesson that we should all learn, you know, and it, it is literally everything. It's not just, you know, left and right, politically speaking, it's not just pain and pleasure. It's like, Hey, what's your relationship like, you know, with your spouse? Is it really, really passionate? And do you guys desire and lust for each other all the time? Are you having heaps of sex? That's cool. But do you guys feel safe? What's the intimacy like there? You know, and vice versa. Are you guys incredibly intimate, but having no sex? Well, you might need to have a little bit more separation and allow time mm. and space to desire each other. It's everything, man. I, I just can't get over how powerful the yin and yang symbol is, you know? Yes. 100%. And the closer you get to this balance, the less things will happen in your life. Mm. Mm. The closer you get to this balance, the more, um, so you become more and more by yourself. So that's what I've been noticing. You don't have any external reflections to show you how imbalanced you are. And eventually you just end up with who you are and just you, and that's it. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's, it. that's so interesting. So yeah. talk to me further on that. I'm really fascinated by that. So if you are a perfect, if you hit like that perfect balance, there is nothing for you in the universe that is going to reflect that because it becomes one. Mm. 
Mm. Right. The moment you're out of this balance, to show you where the imbalance is, you will need some sort of an external reflection. So yeah. a partner to fill you and give you that balance or the food or the passion. So the more things you're distracted doing, so the more busy you are and the bigger your projects and all that, that's how much the imbalance is in order to make you feel that oneness. Wow, that's so true, isn't it? Yeah, oh, man. So, blow my head again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, absolutely. So the closer you get to that core and the closer the reflection is becoming smaller and smaller, that's why all these monks, they fuck off there because they don't have any reflections left and it comes down to the bare minimum. And the moment you hit enlightenment, boom, there's no one else there. It's only you and you become one with the universe. I figured this out last year. Um, at a New Year's party, at the last New Year's party, when I started um, tripping again, and uh, oh, I man, did. it was so, in- I did, I did, I broke my sobriety after yeah, one year. I was gonna say, yeah, it was insane. Like, yeah, I took like five hits of some acid, and I was just like, <laughs> I could see this mirror everywhere, and this mirror had like a little crack, and I could fill this crack through chanting, and as it got closer, then automatically my body would like walk away and away from the party, and I just was looking at this dot, and the moment I hit self-realization, I couldn't see anyone. I was just there by myself and just staring into this little dot. And then I realized, I was like, fuck, there's no reflection now, and there's no one around because I hit that point. And as I moved away from that point, people closest to that balance who are also in that zone started showing up, and then further out, further out. And then I started meeting people later on in the party who were really far out from that balance. And that's what happened. So that's why based on your vibe, you would meet certain people in your life. And then if you drop your vibe, certain people show up. And if you raise your vibe, certain people drop out automatically. Whoa. Yeah, it was insane. Jeez. That's unbelievable. So you're seeing, you're seeing these people in that trip that are closest to that balance point. And yes, what was that? Did, did, did most of them have some kind of a spiritual practice or like some way to like attain that contentment? Well, when I hit self-realization, there was no one there. Mm-hmm. Everyone else was probably high and they were very close, but they hadn't hit self-realization yet. But if there was someone else who had self-realization, they would have been next to me. Yeah. So those people who are, they're all like really onto it people as well. So they're all very close and I was just out of balance. And then they showed up in my life to complete the balance in that part of reality. (laughs) (laughs) That's unbelievable. That's amazing. I feel, I'm trying to give you a a live update. I feel uh, slightly anxious is too strong a word based upon our discussion, but I feel um, a little bit on from that. So I'm just trying to figure out the balance there of like what you're saying, you know, because perhaps like I feel like I need that kind of, I don't know, I don't know, but that's just, it's just really affected me in a way. I found that really fascinating what you were saying. (laughs) Because if, if you're a complete being, right, then you just become, it's like a drop in the ocean. Boop. You just become that. Mm. Right. And you can clearly see this when you hit a nang, by the way. When you hit a nang and you go to that point and then working backwards, then all the senses start to come active. Mm. And now, so if I'm having a really good practice, really good routine, that's why in the lockdown, I didn't have to see a lot of people. I was just super happy and I realized how much am I out of balance. I'm exactly out of balance by the amount of, by the music I'm making. So the music, when I make it and I feel this sense of like, I am, oh, this feels so good. This sense of completion, that is the amount of energy that I need in order to be complete. Mm -hmm. And that is true for everyone in all their pursuits. So Mm -hmm. that's the amount of energy you need. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like what you, what you derive, um, as, as exciting and fun externally is the, is the amount that you actually lack internally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's so true, man. And I, I, like I, I, uh, constantly have to stop myself 
or remind myself of that in, in my relationship whenever I'm, you know, shitty at my partner or whenever I'm, you know, wanting more of this or that, I have to remind myself that I'm doing that thing again where I'm like using her as a way to fill me up and I shouldn't do that. I should mm-hmm. use that as a point of awareness to show where my work is, you know, and I'm saying this mm. to now on the podcast, please don't take it as I've got this down pat. I do not have this down pat whatsoever, but it, it is something <laughs> I try to remind myself of. hundred <laughs> percent. And no one does like, you know, mm. because again, it, like even if you're enlightened, you still have to do the laundry. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter who you are. It's, it's just like, it's a fact of life. And uh, I could, you know, practice meditation for 50 hours in a week. And then I get on a phone call to sort my flight tickets out to New Zealand because I'm going in December. And they're like, oh, we can't do anything because the system's down. And I'm like, ah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm just like, what is this? But it happens. It, it's meant to happen. It's like always showing you exactly where you are. Mm. And that's why when you love someone, then it's just different because that need is gone. You just like let them go and it's like whatever. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. True love is that kind of allowing them the mm. freedom to be and do exactly. whatever they want to be and, and, and all of that. Yeah. That, you know, um, I think I just figured out as you were talking where that kind of fear was coming from. I, I've been obsessed for a long time now with meaning and purpose. You know, it's been a big part of my content, uh, written a lot of stuff on it. And, uh, towards the end of it, towards the end of the second book that I was writing, it was, it's much more to do with this coming back to the self and this idea of acceptance. And I realized towards the end point, it's kind of funny coming full circle in this podcast that, you know, we were talking about people getting attached to their healing journeys and people getting really attached to something. There must still be something down there. And that's just perpetuating and exacerbating these issues because after all that true stage of, of completion is acceptance that that might always mm-hmm. affect me but it's a positive and negative experience that i can't control you know as an example um yes i think when you were talking about self-actualization self-realization coming to that point where you know the balance is so on point that there's nothing external that needs to show you your um discrepancies or imbalances that anxiety for me was coming from a point of well what what happens when i don't have to do anything so i think on some conscious levels, I was about to say unconscious, but I think I'm quite conscious of it. I still am quite attached to this need to do. I think I still derive a lot of my uh, value and worth from, from doing. And, uh, you know, I think about it sometimes because I want to be aware that I have decided to play that game. And it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, look, if I, if I want to be a podcast, I want to be a writer, I want to speak to really interesting people be aware that you're going to have to play with the ups and downs of anxiety, play with the ups and downs of perhaps existential confusion and things. But I think I still get lost in there sometimes. I think what you just said there was a really classic example of me recognizing that I just got lost in it. (laughs) Yes. But see, obviously when I had self-realization, that wasn't through a natural means. Hmm. So this process of me, see, I can't sit idle. I have to like, before this, I was like working on a track. As soon as this is done, I'm going to work on a track. Yeah. So that is the process of us getting there naturally. Mm. So this is the method. So the way you're getting, whatever you're doing with so getting lost in it is the way to get there. There is mm. no other way because as you keep going through it, then you do everything you set your mind out and then you'll be like, ah, this is not it. This is not it. This is not it. This is not it. And then eventually you'll be like, fuck it. I'm just going to go straight for whatever it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the natural process. Have you read, uh, be here now by Ram Dass? No, it's a brilliant book. Uh, you know, Ram Dass, obviously. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he fell into all this sort of stuff when he was really lost at, at around 30 and he, he had a lovely job, he had a, a nice car and he was a psychologist and, you know, a, from the Freudian school. And uh, cool. he started taking, um, he did mushrooms with Tim O'Leary, I think it was in the 60s and he just became obsessed. And, like, it reminds me, you remind me of, you know, his writings a little bit because he was using, he was using mm-hmm. psychs as a way to kind of like test the, the consciousness waters you were using float tanks mm-hmm. and obviously psychedelics as well. Uh, 
he was playing around with all these things. Then he, and then he went to uh, India and he met his guru, um, mm. the Maharaji. And um, one thing that really stood out to me from his writings was that he was still really attached to LSD because he was, he was getting really high but all, always coming down, of course. Mm. And he was speaking to his guru about LSD and his, his guru um, was just, just literally was just a mirror to this point of self-realisation. He was just a mirror. He wasn't even there, you know, um, which I struggled to understand at the time, but I think to your point, it's like he was so balanced all the time that the external yes. world was, you know, it, it wasn't even there for him. And yes, there are YouTube videos of watching people just standing next to this guy and just breaking down in tears because they're just seeing themselves so profoundly for the first time. You know, it's, it's yes. unbelievable watching those videos. And yes. anyway, Ramdas uh, apparently gave him all this LSD and apparently it was like a shit ton of LSD in him, like a huge, huge trip. Um, and he just went bang and just had it all and nothing changed. You know, it was literally just him sober or not high on psychs didn't matter. Uh, And it was that, it was that point of like you made before, you know, if you can reach that point, it doesn't matter what you do externally. It won't change that internal state. Yes. It's like you multiply, you amplify whatever there is. If there's nothing there, how can you amplify it? Yeah. (laughs) Zero (laughs) times zero. (laughs) Exactly. You can't do it. Yeah. And, um, that's what I've realized now with like different substances, it, you reach a level of self-realization at different, like different part of the ladders. And obviously DMT takes you to that level. And then you have the acid. And then when you smoke, people do hit self-realization when they smoke, they just don't realize it. I mean, they don't think about it in that zone. And if I smoke, I hit self-realization and then I'm there, but Mm. not at the deepest part of it. I'm just like in the surface level there. Mm. And the float tank also does that. Once you hit, say, Samadhi in the float tank and you come out, you're like in the nicest, mildest part of that. Meditation also does that, right? Mm. So it's all getting there and just chilling in that zone. And if you can do this every day, then then things that match you will be different because your vibe is completely, you go into a different plane, so to say. It's like, you know, there's silence and there's sound, but together it's music. Music is something completely different. Yeah. It's not just silence and sound. So the yes. same way, once you raise your vibe to this zone, it's not that you're just high, you're just a different person. Yeah. And because these enlightened beings, there's nothing in there. It's just like, boom, nothing really matters for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. God, it's so, it's so fascinating. And again, I, it, it sounds very logical to me. No, nothing, Nothing that you're saying sounds like okay, yeah. this, this dude's clearly still on acid. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's, it's nothing to do with the belief system. No, it's, it's nothing not. to do with anything, but it's just observation. Yes. Just observe and deduce. If there's smoke, I know there's fire. I know that. So that's the intelligence you're using. Right. If I'm if there's a waking life, if there's a dreaming life, and if everything is the same fractal, then this is also a dream. Mm. Same principle. It's all about having these fundamental, and I only derive from one fundamental principle. It's called Om Purnamada Purnamidam. Take a full, take a piece from the fullness. The fullness remains the full, and the piece is also the fullness. Mm-hmm. That's all you need. Just use this everywhere, and you'll see you can derive everything there is to know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. Oh, I love it, man. Hey, uh, What you got coming up now that uh, the virus is starting to cool down? What's happening? So I'm going to New Zealand. Uh, I've got a few gigs there. So I'm going to go quarantine for two weeks and Mm -hmm. then New Year's party. And my best friend, he's got a new studio there. So I'm going to be making some side trance and some chill music and then uh, stay there for about three to four months. And now that my business is online, I'm able to do clients from there and just live in the studio. And uh, go for some really nice hikes in New Zealand and, um, and then come back. I actually don't know where anything is going. Yes. Like, <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. I'm um, just like day-to-day stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to go see my friends and all that. But I'm really into, um, like I told you, Vedic temples. Oh, 
dude, it's mind blowing. Mm. Like, check it out. It's so insane. Like, I'm not talking about ideas that have been written in books. So I started following this. I've been to these temples when I was young, but I didn't know what it was about. Mm-hmm. Imagine a massive mountain, right? And it's like some sort of a really hard rock that you can't really do anything with. And, you know, usually we build things by adding stones. Mm-hmm. They've carved out a whole temple from this mountain. Wow. So they've carved everything out to leave a massive temple. And this thing is exactly like a DMT trip. No mistakes, perfect fractals as if it's cut by laser. Whoa. Right. And people came to, like, invaders came to destroy the temple. They couldn't do it because it's so hard to even break the rock. But these, and this whole thing is about 70 feet high, made out of a single stone. Whoa. And this thing is just left there. And there's thousands of these, like thousands of these ancient temples, and no one knows how they built it. And historians are saying it's 900 years old, done with chisel and stones. And it's insane. Like, there's a huge mystery. And I'm just like, guys... You have to see these temples and the architecture in them. It's just like, wow. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll send you a link of this book that came out recently. It's called the immortality key. Have you heard of this? No, this guy, um, Brian Murescu has basically Mm -hmm. for the last 12 years, um, studied ancient use of psychedelics and he brought it back to this place called Eleusis where basically, Ah. have you heard of this? Yes. Yeah, it's, um, he's actually never done psychedelics, which was like the buzziest part for me. I saw him I on know. Joe Rogan. <laughs> yes, I can't believe that. Oh, man. That but I guess it's good. Me. I guess it's good because then people wouldn't just say he's just a trip guy who's tripping out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's so true. But it just made me think okay. when you're talking about these temples, it's like, you know, Western democracy was founded on this idea of, you know, connecting with the gods from these ancient potions and things and people like carving in stone from the sounds of things, these baby temples carving in stone, what they, you know, experienced and the Eastern traditions, you know, they don't use, you know, you know, we, we talk about drugs all the time on the show. Um, but, uh, you know, they weren't really using it. They were using these, these seclusion practices, these incubation periods, these ideas of just connection to the self to come to these realizations. I think that's so much more beautiful, you know, but it was more it was more accessible at that point in time because when you walk out and you go say hi to your friend, the way you say hi is you are that, I am that. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like the whole culture was just in that vibration. So it was really like nowadays when kids, um, they start using smartphones when they're like three or four and that's just part of it. So the same way it's easy for them to get into technology, the same way it was easy for us, our ancestors to just go into that zone automatically. Everything was based or designed for you to be in that zone. That's such a good so point. So it was much easier. We should start saying namaste to each other. I think that's such a good one. It's 100%. like, hey, I can see the God in you. Can you see the God in me? Namaste. Oh, thank God yes. you can see the God in me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was freaking and out for a second. <laughs> I was talking to one of my clients today and something, something came up and he was like, oh, so are you saying that we're God? I'm like, first define it. And then obviously I was like, look, I can multiply a trillion cells in one hit without even thinking about it. True. I can like paint my reality in any color I want. I can decipher sound, smell, taste. I mean, I can do everything magical in just like one hit without even thinking about it. True. So obviously that's what I'm saying. And you're like, what can you do? And he's like, um... Not nothing. <laughs> like, I can kiss someone kind of crazy. and in seven years time, I can kiss someone again with different lips. Yes, exactly. You know, people are like, oh, science is going to have this technology where you can completely replace every part of your body. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm doing it already. <laughs> exactly. Like, Dude, we can tell by your beard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's what's up. Uh, so I want to go to India so at some stage and really go check out these Vedic temples and really map out like what is actually going on. There's mm-hmm. a lot of history in the folk tales that people say in the local villages where the temples are. There's a lot mm-hmm. of truth in it. So I'm just going to go dedicate a part of my life to doing that. And I'm just that's waiting awesome. after maybe after the New Zealand trip, come back, chill for a bit, and then, yeah, go to India. Oh, man, I can't wait to do a podcast. We should do a podcast when you're in India. That would be sick. 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. Like all the findings I've got, I'm following this guy called Praveen Mohan, P R A V E E N M O H A N on YouTube. So he's the guy who like really triggered the interest. And oh, check out his Anchor Watch series. Oh, just mind blowing. Just a guy with his camera, and just like finding all these mysteries and just completely off track and like it's beautiful. Oh man, I love it. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll have to get you to send me the link for that. That'd be awesome. Yes. hundred percent. I'll, um, well, I'll, I'll put the website in the show notes as well, because there were heaps of people that were um, interested in our, in our first podcast. So that'd be nice. awesome. Um, people, are you active on Instagram still? I am. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The float guru. The float guru. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Such a good name. Dude, thank you so much for doing this show. Like I said, we'll, uh, we'll aim to do the next one when you're in India. I think that'd be awesome. You'll be vibrating so yeah. high. I'll be like, man, who the hell's this guy? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Legendary. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I had like a really good time. Cause I can like speak whatever I feel like on this podcast is just like, boom, straight into it. Straight in. Dude, I'm the same. I, I, I feel that way about you, man. I think, um, yeah, last time we hung out, it was just the only, the only, um, thing I didn't like about it was we didn't have enough time, you know, so I wanted to get right into it again. Mm. You know, I, I love this stuff. I love hearing people like you talk that in my opinion, talk about the necessary things. Like we can get lost in like, Oh, it's Trump or Biden or whatever it is. And you know, that that's, that's cool. Like I play that game every now and then or, um, you know, whatever it is, but like the fundamental nature of reality, I think is like mm. really, really cool conversations. And, uh, mm. thank you so much for, uh, for going no deep, man. It was fun. So what have you been up to? Yeah. Well, uh, for me, I've been, um, getting, getting some new podcast gear. That's been fun. I want to build the content on YouTube a little bit more, uh, still loving my writing. Um, so I've written a couple, I was just writing all year, dude. I was basically just writing mm. all year and um, book two is coming out soon, which is really exciting. Done the audio book for that and got the, uh, the book cover sorted. So I'm really pumped to um, wow. get that one out there. Yeah. It's really fun. But dude, I've just been um, having loads of fun with, with the family. Um, got the dogs and got Siobhan as well. I know Siobhan would love to have you on her uh, podcast as well. That'd be awesome. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So no, we'd be good. We moved out to the country. Yeah. I heard you were saying. So good. <laughs> so it's the country, but it's not too far country. So if I need to catch a train in, I can catch a train in and go to the footy or something. Cool. That's awesome. It's good fun. It's good fun. Nice. Well, mates, we'll, uh, we'll do that show when you're in India and um, I'm sure we'll be talking regularly uh, in between. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Love it, man. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Talk next week. Bye. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.